Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to our YouTube spaceship program. My name is Jackie Faraday, and I'm an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm going to be your host and moderator today for a very special Earth Day program. So happy Earth Day, everybody. Uh, the name of this program is From Sun to Sea Life, and it's part of our full day of Earth Fest celebration that's been going on all day. You might have caught one of our earlier programs, and we've got more programs for you throughout the day. But this program is a live program that we're bringing to you here on our YouTube channel. And a couple of housekeeping, because it's live, we're watching the chat right now. I am watching the chat right now. I can see you guys uh, in here. Um, I'm going to be using this chat as we go through the program to pull your questions and bring them live onto our YouTube conversation so I can bring them to today's speakers. So tell us where you're watching from and who you're watching from. I have seen already Mrs. Wright's third grade classes here. Welcome to Mrs. Wright's class. I saw some folks coming from Italy, from all over the place. Tell us. We would love seeing where you guys are watching from. Um, Okay, so we will be um, monitoring the chat, and so I'll be pulling questions from the chat, but you also have three fantastic scientists that are in the chat that are going to be looking at any of the questions that you have as we kind of carry on here and answering them for you. That's Ross Ong, Eleanor Sterling, and Anna Porzakensky. So all three of them, if you see their names, they are experts on today's topics, and they will be able to answer your questions. Um, another round of business here is that the American Museum of Natural History is open and you can come visit us at the museum. You can plan your, your visit by going online and booking yourself um, a ticket or a spot. The Hayden Planetarium is open. It's actually now reopened. We're so excited that it's reopened and it's limited capacity, but you can come in and see our brand new space show, Worlds Beyond Earth. And if you can't make it in, you can always join us here on the first Friday of every month at 1 p.m. on our YouTube Spaceship channel, where we take you on flights around um, the digital universe, around the, the Earth, around the solar system that gives you a little taste of what you might have been getting in the uh, planetarium. All right, so that's all of my to-dos. Remember to keep up the chat, and I'll be monitoring and maybe saying, if you tell me where you're, you're from and where maybe what class you're in, I'll bring your name in. Uh, to the conversation. But without further ado, I would love to introduce uh, our our speaker for today, Natalie Goodkin. Natalie is, hi, Natalie. Happy Earth Day, Jackie. Hi, how are you? Happy Earth Day. And you are an expert on the Earth, past, present, and hopefully future. So I'm so excited that you're going to be taking us on this tour today. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm an uh, oceanographer. So I study our Earth's ocean and the role it plays in our climate. And since it's Earth Day, we're gonna be looking back at Earth. And here to help us do that is Dr. Carter Emmert, who is the Director of Astrovisualization at American Museum of Natural History. Hi, Carter, how are you? Hi, Natalie, uh, I'm, I'm doing great and happy Earth Day 51 to all of you out. Happy Earth so, Day, Carter. Yeah, so I, I will uh, be piloting live uh, open space. Open space is our NASA supported uh, freely available software. And in the banner, you can see that uh, our website's openspaceproject.com. We're pleased to actually be doing something new today. To understand how the Earth behaves, you really have to understand how it looks over time. And so satellites gather data and also um, large computers simulate its process. And um, so with this, Open Space is an international collaboration um, that uh, is between Sweden's Lynn Shipping University, University of Utah, and New York University, along with us, of course, and it's directed through American Museum of Natural History. Today, we will be featuring some new technology where we're actually bringing in movies of this various data of observing Earth and simulating Earth into open space. Because this is somewhat experimental, um, some of our visuals may stutter every now and then, but uh, hopefully everything will go well. And uh, we've been working, because we're also an open source project, we've been working with a company called the Illuminati. Not I, but the letter E, Illuminati. And they've been working extensively with 
NASA's sister federal agency, which is our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They pulled together lots of data to show on a sphere, either projected in the museum environment or here, debuting for the first time in open space. So Natalie, I thought we would uh, start off uh, here from the museum where we all wish we could be today. Um, but uh, I'll begin pulling out uh, to gain a, a greater perspective. Right. Thanks for that introduction, Carter, about open space. It's really an amazing tool and we're very lucky to be able to start using it to look at Earth. And I know in this program, we normally look out from Earth at all of the stars and other planets in our solar system. But today we wanna show you how we can look back at Earth because it's Earth Day. And Earth is one of the most unique planets in the solar system. It's the only planet to have water on its surface, Carter, and that water's coming into view now. And 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, which is a large part of what drives our climate and how our climate works is from these oceans that are moving around our planet all the time. And as we pull out, you can start to see the clouds, um, which are also made um, composed of water and they're circulating around um, the earth as we shift out and start to get a look at our solar system. So what I'm gonna do, Natalie, is I'm, yes, going, to, I'm gonna bring up um, a trail. This is a sort of orbital trail Great. of Earth as it uh, flies um, <laughs> around the sun. The as sun. We <laughs> around the sun. And um, so then uh, we can start to see other trails. Um, and so if I, if I just pull back quickly here, we begin to see a trail that goes around Earth. That's, of course, our moon. And we can see the stars out there. And then, of course, the star we care about is, is our, our star, the sun. So um, let and me pull out a little farther for you. Sure. So what's interesting as we look at these orbits, and so you can see um, multiple different planets orbiting around the sun, is that they don't make a circle around the sun. And so here we have the planets. You can see them on their orbits, and they're quite bigger than normal, but it get, lets you to see them very clearly. And the orbits are elliptical. They're more like um, ovals than they are circles. And so that means that our sun is a different distance from the earth throughout the year. Um, you can also tell that the planets are all moving in a plane around that sun. Like Carter can spin around a little bit and we'll be able to make that more clear. See that? Actually, I thought I'd also point out, you can kind of see that Saturn is sort of tipped over to mm -hmm. the direction of travel. Um, and so uh, I'll bring up Earth's axis. It's a spin axis. That's that little line you see. Yes. Uh, okay. So that, the, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll shrink the other planets down. So we're just going to talk about Earth. <laughs> so I think Carter was pointing out, um, to, you know, both Saturn and Earth, um, and it was really easy to see with Saturn actually, but Saturn and Earth aren't um, perpendicular to that plane of orbit. So those two lines that are sticking out of Earth now, um, those are a simulation of the axis around which the Earth spins. And you can see that it's a, about a 20 degree angle to our blue orbit line. So this means that the sun's um, distance to the Earth not only changes, but the angle that it's hitting Earth changes as well. And so if we think about our climate system, the sun is really where the whole system starts and the heat that we receive from the sun. But the planet receives different heat at different places throughout the year. And that's how we get our seasons. So I think Carter and I have been playing around a bit with Antarctica, which is on the Southern Pole. I'll come in you here, can... Natalie, and, and so that we just, uh, we still see the spin axis. And Antarctica, everybody is that white, uh, the, the white continent on the um, Southern Ocean. It seems as though we may have lost uh, Carter and open space temporarily yep. here. Oh, it's back. Okay. Oh, hopefully it's back. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just thought, I, Natalie, I, I'm pointing this out with Antarctica. If I come in a little closer, um, why, why is Antarctica always so cold? <laughs> So the, uh, Antarctica remains cold in large part because of the ocean circulation, actually. But what you're seeing right now is winter in Antarctica. And I think you can notice that each time it spins, that's 24 hours. But Antarctica isn't getting any sunlight. And that's because in Antarctica's winter, the northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun. And the southern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun. That's the tilt effect that we have on the planet. And if we speed this up really quickly, we can move ourselves into Antarctic summer. Okay, I'll keep going. 
Okay. Right now, Natalie, we're in July, so we're, we're oh still, great. Yeah. So that's we're, that's Northern Hemisphere summer. We've got to get all our way around. Very September. And we're going to come Excellent. around. Okay. And, uh, let's see. This is October. <laughs> November. So I think we can probably slow down even here um, okay. because this Great. right now you can see in this 24 hour period, Antarctica is getting sun um, the whole day long. And so Antarctica has sun 24 hours a day in its summer and almost none at all in its winter. And that's relative to this position. So we see that here in New York, for those of you who live um, near the museum, and that our days in the winter are much shorter. And that's because the sun is pointing towards Antarctica or towards the Southern hemisphere in particular. Um, and then in the summer, when the sun is positioned a little bit more towards the Northern hemisphere, we get um, longer days and warmer days with more solar radiation. And that explains sort of how we get seasons is because of the way Earth, Earth, Earth orbits. Um, I think now, Carter, it would be kind of fun to see how we observe our Earth from space. I'm, I'm going to shrink Earth down, Natalie, and I'm going to get rid of this sure. uh, axis, just reminding us how tiny, tiny, tiny Earth is. I had enlarged all the planets earlier by a factor of 2,000. Wow. But now, as we swing back down, we see the moon a quarter million miles away from us. That's the orbit. That's that line going around. And then only now do we start to see the tiny... Um, pale blue dot that is, uh, that's our Earth. I'm going to turn on satellites, Natalie. There we go. Great. Well, okay. before we do, do you have a question? Yeah, we, we, we got lots of students in the audience, by the way. PS6 Great. is here. Um, I want to make sure I give you guys proper shout outs. So I'm going to try and do that as we go, as we go through too. But we did have a good question from Isabel. Um, Isabella Velez, and it was on distances, because I don't think we said how far away the sun and the earth were. Carter just mentioned the moon, but maybe we give them the earth sun as well. Well, the, 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 the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth, and, wow. and uh, the moon's only a quarter million miles away, but that's pretty far, <laughs> considering, so we can see, and these satellites out here in this ring are about 23,000 miles away from earth. They're the ones that form the geosynchronous ring. So, so there's um, there are roughly 3,000 satellites circling the Earth, right, Carter? Yeah, so we're just seeing a portion of them. These This outer ring I told you about, If I mm -hmm. try, I'm going to try to orbit with them. If I orbit with them, you can kind of see them dotting about, but I'm trying to orbit with this outer ring. Notice how we're matching the spin rate of Earth. And so at this distance, if you put a satellite out there, we call it geosynchronous because it, it synchronizes with the rotation of Earth. Um, and uh, But you can see the other satellites much closer to Earth are going really fast. So I'm going to slow us back down so it's a little more graceful. I'll get, of, <laughs> I'll get rid of the other lines, which are all the other planets and stuff, so that we can now just kind of look at, at uh, this, uh, this more sort of beautiful situation of our Earth turning and the satellites around it. So. I'll so as, as we move in closer, you can see that the satellites start to be colored red. And those satellites are in um, what we call lower orbit, but they're orbiting much closer to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the satellites that we use most often to observe climate phenomenons. And I think Carter can turn on one particular satellite called Terra. Yeah, I'm going to do that now. Mm -hmm. what, I'll, what I'll do sure. is I'll turn Terra on and we're going to... I, it was going to jump to sort of a specific time and this funny looking picture of the earth with all the <laughs> hat scratches across it. And I'm going to get rid of the other satellites. There we go. Right. So here comes Terra. So Terra is one of the satellites that um, is launched by NASA in order to observe the earth's climate and understand um, how the atmosphere and the oceans are working together to, um, to monitor our climate system. And, we may have frozen a little bit again, but um, there comes Terra around. And one of the interesting things with the satellite data that has made um, today particularly challenging is that when they're in this lower orbit, they're not moving at the same rate as the sun, as, as sorry, as the Earth, as Carter pointed out. And so we get these cat scratch lines, um, which is what Carter affectionately calls them, in the middle of the Earth. Carter, can you explain to everybody how that happens? Sure. Um the, at, uh, at this height of orbit, which is about the 
uh, about the height of the International Space Station, so a few hundred miles above sea level, the satellite is going around in a near polar orbit, but as it comes past, it's taking a continuous picture. That's that band we see right underneath it. It'll come back. And so over 24 hours, this NASA satellite goes around the Earth and takes sort of a continuous picture, like a band. And here, here it comes, right down center line on this band. And so it, it looks left and right, you know, and it can only see so far. So it has sort of massive overlap at the poles, like up here. So we get good uh. coverage of the pole, but um, it misses a little bit uh, geographically when we get closer to the equator. That's really interesting. And it, it's because of that, everybody, that when we shift to looking at ocean data in just a few minutes, um, we're going to be not using the raw satellite data itself. So we're going to have used data that found a way to cover in those gaps so that we get a clearer picture of the Earth, just like we switch to now. And so, yeah, Natalie, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn off uh, Terra, and um, I'm going to, uh, let's see, just pause time here because sure. uh, I can now bring up some of that satellite data in motion um, that was taken by those geosynchronous satellites where they, they just sort of observe the same geography night and day. So uh, I'll, I can turn that on for us. Right Great. Now. Yeah. Here you're going to see that's night and day. This is day, night, in infrared. And then daytime again, we see the colors, night. And so we're seeing weather, I guess. Yeah, this is really um, a great satellite, and sometimes you'll see this uh, data from this satellite used in a weather report, and it's a great satellite to be able to look at large-scale weather patterns. So all of those clouds that are spinning around are, are making weather in specific locations. And I want to point out the main difference between weather and climate. So weather is what's going to happen today. Today where I am, it is strangely cold. April is normally a warm month and it is very, very cold and windy today. We actually have the heat on here at my house. Mm -hmm. And um, that's sort of what you would predict the next day. But climate is really an average of what you would expect over the next hundred years. Um, so in New York, we expect that we're going to have four seasons and that the winter will be cold and snowy and the summer will be warm and sunny. Um, in Mexico, which we can sort of see on the edge there, um, it's warmer and humid all year round compared to New York. In Antarctica, there is ice all year round. That's the climate. Um, and so when we are talking about climate, we're talking about what we can expect um, over long-term averages rather than what we would expect on any given day. Does that make sense to you, Carter? Yes, in fact, uh, it, there's, there's so much going on in this It's image. a lot. <laughs> it's, you know, the astronauts, when they flew to the moon, they talked about the beauty of Earth, um, but you know, they couldn't really see it changing very much. They could see over time it rotating, but the behavior of Earth, if you could just see it over time, this is kind of, this, it, this, um, movie here excites me because we can see, um, you know, the animation over time, but really sort of look at it as a planet and and see it as a living planet that it is. It's 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 truly extraordinary. So um, well, I, I it. <laughs> when when I'm teaching oceanography class, I always say one of the biggest challenges for understanding the ocean is that you can't normally see it. Um, the water is moving all around you, but it's all blue, it's all the same color, and the movement scales are usually larger than you can see. And so satellite data has really given us an opportunity to dig into visualizing what we're studying to understand it better. And that might be a great moment to try to switch on um, some of the ocean data. Wow, that was quick, Carter. I like that transition. No. Um, there we go. Really yes, good. Jackie? Yeah, before we switch, um, we've got lots of students. They're also looking for shout outs. Shout out to PS217. I see you in the chat. I see that you guys are excited about being here. Um, but we had a question from Lisa Wright, and this was about the Terra satellite. And there mm -hmm. were lots of questions about satellites to remind everybody. We said there are about 3,000 up there, but how long has Terra been up there? Do you know? I, I know we launched the first climate related satellites in, I think, the late 1980s, early 1990s. Carter, do you know the exact time that Terra was launched? I believe Terra was launched, or we started getting data from it, I think, in 1998. Um, okay. 
but NASA makes the imagery uh, that we're using uh, to, to show um, uh, not what we just showed, but with the movie and the dynamic data, but the, the global image of Earth, uh, NASA's global imagery browse service, located at NASA Goddard outside of Washington, D.C., has all that data going back to about 2000 from many different satellites, which is a truly amazing archive that your tax dollars supports um, um, from NASA. So it's, it's really a fantastic resource. Um. Great. So the data that we're looking at right now is actual um, satellite data and observational data that's been um, projected um, across the globe. And it's showing you um, first the movement of the water. So when you see those colors moving, that's telling you the direction um, that the water is flowing. And then the color itself is telling you um, what the sea surface temperature is. And so the really warm water that we can see there in the Gulf of Mexico around Florida is shown in red. And then as you move up to the Arctic where the water is quite a bit cooler, um, you get sort of the blues and the greens. So that's the color scale. And the warmest water on earth in this color scale is deep, deep red, which we find in the Western Pacific, which we'll look at in a minute. And that water is a little bit warmer than um, your bath water that you would have if you were taking a warm bath. And the greens um, are a little bit more like what the water's like in the New Jersey shore if you go swimming in the summer. So it's quite a bit colder, just to give you an idea of the difference in those color scales. And we're having a look here as the earth spins around. And you can see here we get some of the warmest water on the planet in that Western Pacific area. Um, Natalie, we've got another question here, and this comes from Yvonne at Ideal for Gifted School. What I see a lot of you guys in here from the Ideal for Gifted School, and that is about how water currents and cloud patterns correlate. Well, so that's a great question, actually, which Carter and I were going to be talking about in a few minutes, not quite so much about the clouds, but about the winds, and they are connected to the clouds as well. And so um, the winds are really what drives the seawater's motion. And if we look across the um, tropical Pacific, in the tropical Pacific, the winds are blowing from the east to the west. So you can see that most of this water is blowing across, is, I'm sorry, is moving across the basin underneath those winds. And then actually right where you see the water sort of flowing backward, that's where the air is rising up and clouds are forming. So we see quite a lot of clouds along the equator and they're there um, pretty consistently. And that's because as the sun hits this point the most on earth, um, it heats up the air, the air rises. And as it cools down away from the surface, it forms those clouds which come across um, the base of the equator. And that's um, another challenge we actually have with satellites in the equator is that the clouds are often blocking um, the satellite's view of the, sea, of the sea surface. And so we get sort of choppy measurements of sea surface temperature because the clouds are blocking it. Um, but if we zoom back to the east, Carter, or, or maybe what we wanna do actually is switch to the other data set now to have a look yeah. at um, just the sea surface temperature with less Clear, clarity on the um, on the currents. And this um, data product is a, a data visualization product made by NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, and they've put it into a general um, circulation model. And you can see that we've got this nice red warm in the tropics. And um, I think we could probably pause here for a second if that's possible, Carter. Um, the equator is made up by that um, is marked pretty much by that green band across the middle. And you can see that the water above it is quite a bit warmer than the water below it. And so we know we're in the Northern Hemisphere summer because of that warmth. But I wanna point out this, you know, New Jersey temperatured water here um, at the equator where you've got the greens and the yellows. And that's because those winds are pulling the water away from the coast and away from the equator and so that's drawing water up from deeper down and it's colder water. And so once it comes up to the surface, you see that there's a lot of cold water in the surface Pacific from what we call that upwelling of the deeper, colder water. 
And Carter, if you move across, that water then stays in the surface. And as it moves across the Pacific, it's exposed to the sun longer and longer. And so that sort of trail of cold water starts to dissipate or go away. And you've got this nice big warm pool over here on the left. Um, and we're not gonna talk about that warm pool too much today um, or too much right now. But if you're interested in hearing more about what happens over here um, in Southeast Asia and in the warm pool, uh, we're gonna be talking about that tonight at 7 p.m. Um, in the Frontiers lecture. I can attest to growing up in New Jersey, it was very cold to go swimming, but it, I've been swimming in Thailand and it's very warm. <laughs> it's pretty warm. So very yeah, warm. My, my children were raised over here in Southeast Asia, so they've never been swimming in New Jersey because that <laughs> might shock them. <laughs> so if we come back over here to the equator, um, I want to explain, or to the eastern part of the Pacific, I want to explain that what we just talked about is the normal situation, Carter. That's how the winds are normally working and how the water is normally flowing. But we have something, um, a climate phenomenon called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And the El Nino Southern Oscillation was actually named by Central and South American fishermen um, because sometimes right before Christmas they would be fishing and all the fish would go away. And when all the fish would go away, they would say, oh, the baby has come, and they would go home early for the holidays. And so that's how we named this, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And that was really our first observation of a climate phenomenon was this sort of return of the lack of fish in what is one of the largest fisheries on the planet. And so how does that work? When we upwell this cold water that we can um, see towards the left of the screen there, it brings up with it also um, chemicals that plants need in order to photosynthesize, um, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. And when you have a lot of sunlight and you have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus from the ocean currents bringing it up from the deeper water, you have a lot of plant life. And so this is one of the places on earth where there's an enormous amount of primary production and then also an enormous amount of fish life that feeds off that plant. So the food web grows quite, um, quite strong here. And so if we switch now to the El Nino situation, what happens yeah. in a great, and is I'll, it fine? I'll, uh, switch to that and, okay. uh, and then we'll hit play. So there, there awesome. you go. Awesome. So in an El Nino situation, those winds die down. We don't know why, but the winds really die down. And so the water stops being dragged across and it starts to flow back from the west to the east. And you can see here that it becomes really, really warm along that equator. You can use those islands there, the Galapagos Islands, which we'll talk about in a minute as your marker for the equator. And so that warm water means that we're not getting upwelling. The tropical water is just um, sloshing backwards almost from the other side. Um, and that is when you lose your nutrients and so you lose your, um, your plant life or your primary production. And we can also look at this by looking at chlorophyll. Carter, do we have the chlorophyll data queued? Yes. Great. Switch to that now, great. So a lot of you, particularly all of our great middle school um, and primary school classrooms out there might know what chlorophyll is, but just in case, let me explain. Chlorophyll is a chemical. It's, if you look around, you might have a plant in your classroom or your house, and that plant is green. And it's chlorophyll that makes that plant green. And it's the chemical that absorbs the solar radiation to um, initiate photosynthesis, to build energy within the plant. And our satellites are able to monitor chlorophyll levels in the ocean as well as temperature. And so what you see here is um, a map of chlorophyll um, and if it's blue or purple, we have very low chlorophyll. And if it's yellow or green, we have um, relatively higher purple um, chlorophyll. And you can see some along those coasts, sometimes we get bright red chlorophyll. Um, and if we go sort of look back at the Galapagos for a minute, Carter, I know it's so exciting to go up to the poles when we're talking chlorophyll, but let's uh, stick to the Galapagos <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> um, you can Sorry. see that in a normal year, um, the chlorophyll around the Galapagos Islands at that equator is really, really high. So uh, it's gonna come back in just a second. 
There we go. And then in an El Nino year, when the currents um, stop and slow down, you can see that the chlorophyll goes away. Um, and the normal year condition is what makes the Galapagos Islands so biologically interesting, honestly, because there's so much plant life there to um, support the ecological system. But then when an El Nino happens, it just goes away. Um, so I don't know, Carter, do we want to switch to have a zoom in on those Galapagos Islands? Oh, sure. Before, before we do, we've you got have a question, Jackie. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of questions. They're all along the same theme. And I, I see you guys saying your schools. That's great. This one's going to come from Daniela Behar from the River School. And it's it's a question of like how long it looks this way. So a lot of people have been asking this, what the Earth looked like when it was born. And so maybe you can say like how long these effects are in effect for and, and how you could compare and contrast to like an, a young planet to what it looks like now? Well, so the oceans are, are so important in our climate um, right now, in large part because of the way that the continents are organized. Um, so there were two big things that happened um, that set up the sort of um, the climate system that we're in now, where you have sort of varying levels of ice ages. And one of those is the separation of Antarctica to make it um, fully isolated by the Southern Ocean. Um, and the other is sort of the closing of Central America, um, which isolated the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean from one another. Um, and this climate system has been in place now um, for millions of years. But at the early Earth, when it was quite a bit hotter, the, the system was really very different. Uh, so I think we'll zoom in on the Galapagos here. Great. And, uh, so the, I'll just uh, fade down the chlorophyll a bit, uh, but we'll, right. we'll now zoom into these volcanic islands here. That's so, how in the atmosphere is. It's an accurate uh, display of it. <laughs> it's oh, that's really cool. <laughs> so the Galapagos Islands are a group of islands, um, and you can see that they have the, the blue underneath is showing you different depths in the ocean. So they've got a little bit of a platform around them. And you can see the volcanic, um, that, yeah, there we go. Um, so you can see that there's multiple um, volcanoes that make up these islands. And um, because they're sitting in this upwelling zone where there's so many nutrients, this is one of the places we have really unique life. And those of you who are um, long followers of AMNH might remember Lonesome George. Um, who was one of, um, is likely the last Pinta tortoise that we know of. Um, and when he passed away, um, he came to the museum for study. And there's a lot that we have online where you can learn more about Lonesome George. And these tortoises are native to the Galapagos. Um, but there's also some organisms that have really evolved on the Galapagos to, to live within an El Nino system. And one of those is the only known marine iguana on the planet. And here you can see him swimming. So most iguanas that we know of are solely terrestrial, but the, um, the Galapagos iguana is a marine animal and he swims around and he eats plants in the water um, for his food supply, for their food supply. And so when you have an El Nino, that food supply goes away. And so the marine iguana has evolved so that it can actually shrink its body size and length by almost 20% in order to require less food when the plants aren't there. And then when El Nino goes away and we return to normal conditions, the iguanas are able to grow back to their normal size. The other organism um, that has uh, big impacts from El Nino is actually the Galapagos penguin. Um, the Galapagos penguin is much smaller than you're probably used to because it's an equatorial penguin and so it needs to keep its body cool. Um, and so the smaller body swims in that really cold upwelled water and that's where the penguin keeps cool. The penguins also eat fish and the fish are dependent on that algae. And so when you have a collapse of the ecosystem, you often have a collapse of the Galapagos, the Galapagos penguin population as well. Um, but they've evolved to be able to recover their populations really quickly after an El Nino. So the dip of the penguin is quite short. Jackie, do you have another question? 
Yeah, we do have another question. And okay. this is this gets to like maybe um, maybe it's philosophical. And it comes from a 12th grade student, Ashley Melendez at West Bronx Academy. And it's about uh, um, basically the impact that humans have on the planet. So if mm -hmm. humans weren't here, is the earth a cleaner, healthier place for us, for the animals, for everything? Um, if humans were here, um, the, there would probably be a cleaner, healthier place, but there might be a different organism in our place causing other difficulties. We're not the only organisms. In fact, almost every organism um, affects the planet when it's growing and populating. We have outsized that effect quite significantly. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges that we face as a population is trying to protect our earth um, while continuing to live on it. And that was a great question, Ashley. And I think that this comes into sort of um, the conversation about anthropogenic warming or climate change, so human-driven climate change as well. And one of the things we're expecting with that is that El Nino will happen more often and could become more extreme. And that could become a problem for our iguanas and our penguins that are used to having, a, you know, an extreme Enzo event every 20 years. Now they might have one every 10 years. And so, um, you know, has, has their evolution um, protected them from an increasing frequency of El Nino? That's great. There was really a, a follow-up question that I would just bring in because I love sure. that question for like, um, cleaner or healthier for who, you know? Because you, mm -hmm. you can make way for the next organism. Mm -hmm. And Raphael Baran had a follow-up on like, how did the new organisms mm -hmm. then form? So. Can, can you say anything about that? Like when one species goes and makes way for another one? We might need Anna or Eleanor to log in on the chat on that one. Um, uh, I'm, I'm definitely a physical oceanographer, so it's a trickier question for me to answer, Raphael, but I think Anna and Eleanor could pop in on that pretty quickly. That's the, that's the joy of having a team of people answering various ways. Yeah, that's also a good <laughs> to remind people that in the chat here, we have three expert um, scientists, fierce female scientists that are in here waiting to answer questions just like this. So, so we're zooming back out to look at that chlorophyll. Yeah. I wanted to uh, just mention that uh, uh, we were flying over the Earth at uh, very high resolution, thanks to a partnership we have with the Esri company as well um, and their data. Um, that uh, we're, that allows us to come really close uh, to the cool. Earth, uh, anywhere on the Earth. So I just wanted to uh, send that out as well. And let's bring the uh, chlorophyll all the way back up. Uh, here we go. And I don't want to get too far away from the Earth. <laughs> I don't know. So I think if we zoom back to Antarctica, actually, we can, we can make our original point with chlorophyll, Carter. Great. Um, so you need nutrients for chlorophyll, but you, you also need the sun. If you don't have the sun, there's nothing to, no energy to photosynthesize with. So when we, um, when Antarctica has no sunlight, you see the chlorophyll levels are almost zero. That's what the purple tells us. And then when the season changes and we start to get sunlight Antarctica, you can see that it becomes almost the same level as the tropical Pacific there for just a couple months. Um, and that's because the, there's nutrients just hanging out there waiting and the sun comes and the plants gobble them all up um, and photosynthesize. And then we run out of nutrients and then we run out of sun and we go back to having um, no chlorophyll around Antarctica. Natalie, don't the whales come down there and feed during that, uh, that period? Uh, yes, in, in both Antarctica and the Arctic, actually. Um, so if we zoom up to the Arctic, it's a really similar pattern. And Sometimes the chlorophyll, the, the plant blooms can only last a day or two um, in the peak of summer and then they'll be gone. But ooh, look at Africa, you see there's, there's a lot of dust blowing off Africa and that brings nutrients to that coastline with upwelling as well. And so you get the bright red colors. Um, in Southeast Asia where we've got the monsoon too, Saudi Arabia can get some amazing amounts of chlorophyll. Yeah, so there's a quick, you know, there's a bloom and then it's gone just like that. Yeah, it's beautiful to look at. Hmm. I, you know, it, it, the one thing I, I think that uh, just bears comment is that when you're actually seeing all these different data cycle and all the different things, the seasonality, the diurnal, you know, the mm -hmm. rotation of Earth and all that, 
is you really get an appreciation of just how complex a system uh, Earth is, this web of life that everything is connected and, and that we're just sitting on top of, however fragile that system is. Exactly. Coming back to Southeast Asia, you, you mentioned that, so I just thought I'd fly over it. All right. Well, I think we're, we've reached the end of the program, everybody. Oh. <laughs> um, and we've had a very lively chat here. I've tried to bring you guys. Uh, there is a continuing questions about chlorophyll in the chat that um, uh, that I think that we could we could probably spend a lot more time on, but we are out of time. So um, thank you guys. Thank you everybody in the chat. We've had so many students that have been in here and have been asking for shout outs. And I'm sorry, I can't give all of you shout outs, but I'm glad I got to give some of you shout outs. Uh, and thank you, Natalie and Carter for such a beautiful tour of Earth. We haven't ever done this exact tour of earth before so i hope everybody well, understands this is very unique it, right, Carter? it, it, it really tested our our, our technical <laughs> team on open space as well as our uh, <laughs> friends at the illuminati um especially clay hooker who really helped us a lot in this give a shout out to him and and also to the esri team for their maps all of this coming together to really show earth as perhaps well it's certainly my favorite planet and i i uh, uh there's no better day to say that than earth that's so, very true. Thank you all. And hopefully it's the first of, of many astronomy online for Earth Day, Carter. Yeah. 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 I, I will just tell everybody, it takes weeks to prepare these programs. So you get to see it in the short time, but everybody was prepping to get these visuals for you. So I hope you loved them. Um, a couple of a couple of outro things real quick. Um, that there's going to be a survey. We're going to put it in right now that lets us improve the programs for you to cater to what you, what works for you and what you'd like to see more of. And your feedback is very important to us. So please fill it out if you have a chance. And everybody that fills one out gets a NASA sticker in the mail. Uh, I know I have a NASA sticker. Carter has a NASA sticker. Natalie, do you have a NASA sticker? Lots of NASA stickers and bookmarks. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope you'll join us for the next Earth Based of uh, Earth Fest event. As I said, it's ongoing today, and it's about to start in a few moments. Um, scientists from the museum's Center of Biodiversity and Conservation are going to present their research about how scientists learn to understand and protect the Earth. It's free, uh, and we'll provide the link here. I'm not sure if it was already it already sh um, showed up. And for those of you that want an even deeper dive, you can join Carter and Natalie tonight. Uh, it's not too late. It's at 7 p.m. tonight for a Frontiers lecture. Um, Natalie, remind me of the title, Unlocking. Unlocking Climate Secrets from Corals. That's the right words, maybe not in the right order. OK. Unlock, unlock <laughs> I think it's all Natalie, Natalie, not me. So <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to provide the, the link in the chat as well. So. Uh, thank you, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe to the Amy and H YouTube channel if you like what you've been seeing. Uh, we're here on the first Friday of every month, and uh, you're, if you're subscribed, you won't miss our YouTube adventures. So, signing off. Thanks, Carter. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>